Hi there, my name is Nathan. Welcome to the Media Hole. This is a YouTube show in which we uh, like to talk about all sorts of different media. That's films, games, uh, television, anime, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and we like to do uh, analysis and reviews and video essays. If you are tuned in to uh, my lovely podcast, which I co-host with either my friend Davis or my friend Ian, um, and you want to see this, that's very improv. We shoot the shit. We talk about all sorts of like current stuff as well as old stuff, just what's going on really. Um, and so I'd love it if you sub to that. But if you want something that's scripted and a bit more in depth, that's what you're here for. And uh, I know if you were tuned into this show before, my last episode came out a year and a half ago, and that was also my first episode. And I'm very sorry if you were uh, awaiting more. I had a couple of ideas in the can. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't get around to finishing them. And then I put it off uh, and am a piece of shit. But I'm back now with a vengeance. So expect these pretty much monthly, although not exactly one month away from each other, because this one took fucking forever. Thanks for joining us. And today's topic is Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> Scott Pilgrim vs. The World is a 2010 film directed by Edgar Wright, starring Michael Sarah and Mary Elizabeth Winstead. It's one of my favorite films, to be honest. It's a romantic comedy action film that's heavily influenced by anime and manga and uh, video games as well. And all three of those things are things I'm into. There's also like a massive like indie rock vibe, and it's based in Toronto, which is my hometown-ish. Uh, it's based on a comic book by Brian Lee O'Malley called Scott Pilgrim, with each volume having a different subtitle. The comic was published between 2004 and 2010 by Oni Press, and uh, the film came out in 2010. So what this means is that the comic ended after the movie came out, and uh, the ending of the comic was influenced by the ending of the movie, and the ending of the movie was written about a year before the comic had a true ending. So there's this piece here where th these two things influence each other, and that, I think that's kind of fascinating. I'm not going to touch on that for a super long time, but there is something interesting about that. So what we're going to do today is do a bit of a slight review on the film and comic. We're going to compare the two, uh, and I'm going to talk about kind of the most important thing to talk about Scott Pilgrim in 2019, and that's the relationship of the main character with women. So Scott Pilgrim is kind of supposed to be an asshole. He does bad things. The start of the story is that he cheats on an underage girl uh, with a different woman that he's actually interested in. Well, he really starts the story dating an underage girl. It's a whole thing. And so parts of that is intentional. You're not supposed to think Scott's a great guy, but you relate to him. But there's also parts of that that come across maybe a little flawed maybe a little problematic, to use a word I don't love. Um, and I kind of want to investigate that, look into it. And so that's the purpose of this video. As I said, this film is highly influenced by anime, manga, and video games, including a lot of direct references to games. Uh, for example, the band The Clash at Demon Head, which is Envy's band, uh, is named after the NES game Clash at Demon Head. Uh, you also have the music from Final Fantasy II, specifically the battle theme, played on bass by Scott in the film, also in the comic. Uh, although, of course, it's actually Final Fantasy IV, but that's a different story for a different time that I probably won't tell you. You also have music used and sound effects used from the Zelda series. Uh, sound effects from Sonic, like the ring pickup noise here. However, one set of references and influences that doesn't really get spoken about is uh, indie music and the city of Toronto. 
indie music, I'm just gonna talk about a little bit here like I did with games. Toronto is gonna to be a whole section of the video because you don't get a lot of Americans hearing about how that works. Um, so for indie music, there's the band Metric. I think they've crossed the border south a couple of times, but they're mostly a Canadian band. Um, Metric's uh, lead singer was actually the main influence for Envy Adams in the comic. And in the movie, instead of singing the song that she sings in the comic, uh, Envy, played by Brie Larson, sings Black Sheep by Metric, and Metric consulted on the film. Oh, yeah. All of Sex bob songs are done by Beck, uh, including uh, Scott's song Ramona. So Toronto, the setting of the film and comic, and the filming location of the film, is an interesting city, and it's gotten its own interesting culture. It particularly has, an, has a great indie music scene. Uh, and that's really well represented both in the film and the comic. One of the locations in the film, Club Rocket, is actually a real place. In the movie, they say, fun fact, this place is a toilet. Uh, but it actually closed in 2005 while the comic was still being written, but before the movie was filmed. So what they actually did was painstakingly recreate it on a set. The Club Rocket was actually famous for being very intimate with the band, but also too intimate. And it was basically a big box of sweat and smells. And uh, it was gross. Another sequence of the film takes place in Lee's Palace, another beloved concert venue in Toronto. The outside of Lee's Palace is featured in the film, uh, but the interior and the back alley were painstakingly recreated on set again. Why? Well, this time it was so that they could abide uh, by the action scenes needed to, to be shot. But another reason was that um, Lee's Palace had a couple years prior undergone a really unpopular renovation and the inside uh, didn't quite look the same as it did in the comic and that central bar area that I'm showing right now uh, was actually completely removed. So when they had bands like Metric come in and supervise on the film for the music, uh, they actually had like a huge emotional moment. They were touching the bar. They had got it just fucking right. A pure reconstruction of a classic Toronto space for the indie punk scene. Lee's Palace is thankfully still around, although Mr. Lee died in 2001, and later uh, Lee's Palace was sold to Collective Concerts, uh, which is a Canadian company that owns many Toronto music venues. So it's not the independent place it was back in the 90s and 80s. It's not just music venues. The film also managed to get famous Canadian brands like Pizza Pizza and Second Cup involved, as well as, more importantly, featuring major Torontonian landmarks like Casa Loma and Honest Eds. So in the background of a few shots in the film, you can see a sign that says Honest Eds. So what was it? Well, Honest Eds was a bit of a fever dream. <laughs> uh, it was a red and gold eye-blasting department store covered in light bulbs that stretch out for an entire city block between Bloor and Bathurst in downtown Toronto. They sold things for extremely cheap, often at a loss, and because of that, they were a haven for artsy hipster types that were broke and poor immigrants to Canada. The owner of the store, Ed Mervish, was a Jewish American immigrant to Canada and everything he touched is important to the soul of Toronto. Uh, not only did he own Honest Ed's, he also owned some restaurants and several uh, theaters in which you'd see plays and things like that, like not a movie theater, the other kind. And he personally oversaw Honest Ed's from 1948 
until his death in 2007. That's a long ass time. Ed's son, David Mervish, took over the company after Ed's death, uh, but he was personally more interested in the theater aspect of the business. So because of that, online retailers and big box stores like Walmart coming into Canada in the early 90s, uh, Honest Ed's got less and less profitable over the years. And so because of that, in October of 2013, the property was sold. Uh, in December of 2016, it was finally closed to the public. And uh, over the course of 2018, the store was demolished to make room for condominiums. Uh, extremely sad. Uh, the Markham Street sign hangs over the Ed Mervish Theater, downtown Toronto, uh, sort of in memoriam. So it's extremely meaningful to a lot of Torontonians, uh, including myself, even though I only went there once when I was extremely young, um, to see that it's sort of commemorated in film, even though in actuality, in the comic, there was a, supposed to be a full fight in there, whereas in the in the movie, it's just kind of in the background. So now we get to the part of the video that is really what I wanted to make the video about, but all the other stuff's in there because I was very scared of doing this part for my first video. And that's why this fucking thing took so long is because I'm an absolute coward. But Scott and women. Uh, so as I said before, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World is a film that is about relationships and romance. And... <sighs> And it's intentionally about someone who's kind of a piece of shit. And by kind of, I mean a lot. So let's talk about the movie. And then this is going to also be a focus when, I, when we talk about the comic. But this is specifically based on the movie. So in the movie at the start, we know Scott is one year off of a terrible breakup with ex-girlfriend Envy Adams, who is the lead singer of The Clash of Demon Head. Now, Envy broke up with him supposedly at a New Year's party. Uh, she dumped him after cheating on him when she moved to Montreal with her best friend, who also happens to be her bass player, Todd Ingram. Now, this is supposedly the reasoning why Scott is such a sad sack throughout most of the movie, um, why he's somewhat of a piece of shit. He drinks because of this. Ultimately, that's what we're told, is Scott is bad due to the envy thing, or Scott is emotionally stunted due to the envy thing. And so that's what we're told. Now, obviously, people are in control of their actions, but also, obviously, when people are emotionally damaged and they're young, like Scott, who is 22, things happen. So, but this is all the explanation we're given. Scott also has extremely low self-respect and self-esteem. He thinks very lowly of himself, um, and he does. he acts a lot of the time as if he was somebody who didn't really love himself. And so who knows if that's due to the envy thing in the movie, at the very least, we don't know if that's due to envy, if that's due to uh, something else in the past, if he's always been like that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But we also know that his friends are constantly talking shit about him and are very frequently mean. <laughs> um, and we don't know if that causes uh, his, his self-worth to be so low, if that's a byproduct of his self-worth being low, or if it's somewhere in the middle. Um, but I just wanted to mention that really quick. <laughs> so, the first woman who appears in the film, woman that Scott dates, is uh, Knives Chow, which I would probably rather say girl, because Knives Chow is the subject of the sentence, Scott Pilgrim was dating a 17-year-old. See, Scott Pilgrim decided to date a, a child, a Knives Chow, who is a, a 17 year old Chinese Canadian Catholic school student, which sidebar, Catholic school in Canada is not like a private school in America. It is a publicly funded school that has uniforms and religious overtones, but you don't have to be Catholic to go because the government pays for it. 
it's its own thing. It's kind of weird, and I think we should probably get rid of them, but people like them because um, uniforms are technically good for children, but when you're the child, speaking as somebody who went to a school with a uniform, it fucking sucks. Sidebar over. So, Knives absolutely falls head over heels for Scott. She loves him a lot. He knows about music. He's in a band. He's an adult, sort of, and he's cool to her, whereas almost everybody else in his life kind of treats him like shit and thinks he's an asshole for good reason. But uh, Knives, he, he's really just using Knives to stroke his ego. Knives thinks he's cool and will dote upon him all day. But um, he's really only held hands with her He's not looking to actually have a physical or even romantic relationship with her. He mostly wants someone who's going to like him and hang out with him. Um, whereas she, being a 17-year-old, growing, wanting to proceed in a relationship, thinking it's a real one, uh, wants to move forward romantically, sexually. She wants to kiss him, which is totally normal on her end. That's what you do in a relationship as you get closer, presumably. Don't want to... Don't want to assume anything here for you guys, but that tends to be how I do it. Um, however, Scott's really not, doesn't want to use her and his morality doesn't let him sleep with a 17 year old, just use her. He's still a piece of shit, but he's not, he's not a pedophile. Um, in the comic, he explicitly said, I would never do anything untoward to her or anything like that, but obviously he doesn't really care about her feelings. He does that because he doesn't want to feel guilty about it. He doesn't want to feel bad. And so he can feel okay and justify pretend dating, dating her. Um, but he doesn't actually care about her feelings. Ramona Flowers is the female lead of this film. And if we're going to talk about Mary Elizabeth Winsett, she's great. She's incredible. Um, this movie is probably the reason why I have a massive crush on her to get into personal shit. But to Scott, he immediately falls in love with her after seeing him in his dream and then in a library and then at a party. Um, while Knives to him is this rebound, this like ego trip that lets him sort of feel better about himself for a little bit, which really what he needs is therapy. Um, while Ramona is like the first girl he's actually wanted to be with in a relationship since getting broken up with a year prior. <sighs> the first thing he says to her is extremely embarrassing. In the movie, it's a weird Pac-Man line. In the comic, it's just, uh, am I, I saw you in my dream and now you're here in real life. Am I dreaming? Um, because he did see her in a dream. And then he leaves her, he stops talking to her, starts following her, does some really gross stalkerish behavior, like ordering a bunch of cool CDs off at of Amazon.ca, uh, and then <laughs> waiting for her to come to his house, and then browbeating her into going out with him. Which, by the way, sidebar, but also not sidebar, because it's the purpose of the video, yikes. So when she finally agrees to go out with him, she does seem to like him even though it's a really gross way to do that, like I said, um, <laughs> and decides not to have sex with him, but sleeps next to him, which he says is something he needs because he's basically, as I was saying before, is missing uh, intimacy. He's missing somebody to enjoy being around him. But, you know, he's not broken up with knives. He didn't dump her yet. Uh, he didn't and that situation because he truly didn't view it as an actual relationship. But of course Knives does. And so that's really fucked. I don't need to explain why cheating on someone's not cool because it's not. He invites Ramona to this, his band playing. Uh, and then Knives is also there. But then after that, he breaks up with his fake high school girlfriend. Just in time to be told that his current new, new girlfriend uh, has seven evil exes that he must defeat in combat. During this time, Knives, who is now 
basically in an incredibly fragile emotional state, um, having fallen in love with somebody and been unceremoniously dumped in a shitty way, and then later finds out that, you know, it was cheating. Knives start stalking Scott, uh, including sneaking around watching them, dyeing her hair to look like Ramona's, and trying to get him back as if he was stolen. Um, she even goes as far as to start dating his fellow bandmates. Uh, in, in, in the movie, it's just young Neil, but in the comic, there's a bit more to that, but we'll get into that later. One flaw that I have with the film over the comic is you don't really get to experience Scott and Ramona in a relationship. Uh, you get to see them kiss and be sweet, and you get to see them, like, fight and get strained, but, like, a couple of times in the movie, but that's sort of, that's not the focus. Like, there's no, you don't get, get a moment to focus on it or to stick with it. Um... And that's because the movie takes place only over a couple weeks and has to be a two hour runtime. And so in the comic, it takes place over the course of about a year and a half. And it was told over the course of six years. And um, that allows for a lot more times to see Scott and Ramona, the couple, Scott and Ramona in love or making the relationship work or just being together as a, like together, togetherness, you know? In the film, this also makes Scott having to tell Ramona he loves her in the climax just kind of somewhat fall flat, uh, as he hasn't spent much time with her. It feels very forced, in a sense. It's it's very movie, which is, uh, again, I understand the reasoning for it. Obviously, in a romantic movie, you want to hear somebody say, I love you. You want that sort of thing to happen. But it's... It's tonally odd with the rest of it. Another big problem with the climax of the film, specifically regarding Scott, is his apology. After Knives and Ramon are both there in the Chaos Theater, Scott has two tries at his apology. The first one, he says, I cheated on Knives with you uh, to, the, to the accusation of the cheating. And... That means that Ramona, he says, was not wronged. Now, obviously that's bad. And part of the purpose of that ending bit is for him to realize that. However, his second apology isn't much better. He says, stop, stop. I cheated on you. I cheated on both of you. I'm very sorry. Or I'm, I'm sorry. He apologizes for cheating on them. But immediately after says, so are we good. Now, earlier in the film, somebody else apologizes for something and then says, you know, water under the bridge. And that character is treated as a piece of shit. But in this scene, it's supposed to be Scott being sincere and we're supposed to be happy with him for that. And I don't like that. That's a shitty way to do it. And again, this is something that's needed to make the film have better pacing to be a better movie. If it included this thing, which I think would treat its themes and subject matter and side plots better, it would ultimately be a more bloated movie with worse pacing, even though it would address something that makes the main character come across shitty. See, because in the comic, when somebody asks him about it, he does apologize. When Ramona talks to him about it, he does apologize. And then it takes a while for it to become a thing. It needs... There's time to react and to forgive from both Knives and Ramona. And again, I'm going to go into more detail about this in the comic book section of the video. I know it's a shitty video, but that's not my problem. <laughs> again, as a whole, I think this movie is great. It's funny. It's sweet. It's cool. It's fun. It's really enjoyable. It's probably the movie I've seen the most times I can fucking do karaoke to this goddamn film. So don't take these criticisms as me thinking the movie's bad. I think Edgar Wright's a brilliant director. I think the cast does a great job. And again, it's a great movie. It's one of my favorites. But the handling of certain subplots and themes could be improved. But I understand that these are poorly done, in a sense, to make the movie more watchable. And it is effective in that way. 
So don't take this as me shitting on it. Again, I spent the first part just loving this movie, so I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way. Finally, with his relationship with women in the movie, we've got Kim Pine. Now again, I'm going to get more detailed on this in the comic because more is stated. Essentially, the way it goes is Kim in the movie mentions that she and Scott did date in high school uh, and that Scott's an idiot and she spends most of the movie being hostile towards him. And uh, we don't really get much clarification onto this, which in the comic we get more. So what do I mean to say about all this talk with Scott and women? And what do I like about it? Well. I don't think there's a problem with movies featuring shitty people as main characters. And what Scott represents is something a lot of people can see themselves in. In real life, people are shitty partners. That doesn't mean they're bad people. There are real In real life, there are people who are frequent cheaters, but that doesn't mean they're bad overall people. And that doesn't mean that like they can't do good. And I think what, what this is trying to do is depict how each and every one of us hasn't always been a good person. I haven't done or thought right things before. I've done shitty things. I've never cheated on anybody. Uh, but, you know, and uh, like I get it. I get it. I understand why people do bad things sometimes and that, that doesn't necessarily make everyone a bad person. And so I do think that a lot of especially guys can see themselves in Scott because Scott is flawed the way humans are flawed. And the movie can have that depiction of a shitty person and still be fun and funny. But again, you get people who miss see this and want to be like Scott or want to want to be influenced by him because he is funny and relatable in that way to a lot of guys. And that's obviously bad, and maybe that's the movie's fault, or maybe that's the people watching's fault. I don't really know, but um, I do get that this is good. I do get that this is intentionally that he's not necessarily a good person. But the way it's portrayed and the and the follow through of that arc is something that I have an issue with with the movie. But with that being said, again, I still like the movie a lot. With that, let's talk about the comics. When you're like that, waving a flag, your hubris is ruthless, you useless comrade. You don't seem to see any irony standing while we think of me. So first, if you like the movie, I highly, highly, highly recommend the comics. Not only do they have the same tone of in the early volumes, it's practically one to one with the movie, including certain shots being nearly identical due to the fact that most of O'Malley's drawings were based on real places and they went to those places to shoot. As the comic series goes on though, the differences between it and the film get more clear as the film has to condense everything together. And as I said previously, uh, the final volume uh, was not done yet when the film was made. So while O'Malley consulted on the ending, the ending is significantly different. Now, as a warning, I am going to spoil the comics for you when I go deep into this shit. So if you haven't read them, you can, you can even do that and come back or you can stick with it and then read them later. Um, I'm of the mind that a spoiler usually doesn't ruin a story. If the story's still good, um, it shouldn't be so reliant on that twist aspect to it to stop being good. And Scott does Scott Pilgrim doesn't really have a twist. So, you know, only loosely spoilers. So let's talk about some surface level differences before we get into the Scott and women big meat and potatoes of this video. So before we get into our meat and potatoes about Scott's relationship with women, I do want to do some basic comparisons between the comic and the film. So one of the things I do want to put up front here, in case you're worried about some of the images that you're going to see, uh, this, this comic was written in 2004, or at least it started in 2004. And it features some really 2004 shit. Because in the mid even to the late 2000s 
there were words that were a lot more commonly used uh, than they are now. So in the comic, you're going to get a lot of retarded and gay used in pejorative ways, which, I mean, we don't like that as much now, obviously. And by as much, I mean, like, at all. Um, <laughs> but it, it was a different time. Obviously, it was, like, over a decade ago. And that was common. There are gay characters in the comic, and they are based on people the author knew in real life. And it's clearly not meant to be pejorative, because even they throw stuff like that around. But it's just that was an extremely common expression in the 2000s. If you remember, you remember. If you don't, you don't. Um, so just be warned. I don't think it comes from a place of hate. It comes from a place of just being a different time and, and more ignorant. But if that if you're the kind of person where that like that hurts you to read, then I wouldn't recommend this or uh, some other comics and indie stuff from the time. Uh, on the other hand, as I said before, the comic takes place over a longer period of time, and that allows a lot of its side plots and characters to develop over time. Uh, it, again, about a year and a half passes over the course of the comic, and it was written over six years. So the writing gets better, and the storylines progress over the time. For example, you get more of Scott and Ramona as a couple and see how they're both trying to run away from their past. This is something you don't see a lot of in the movie. You see some of Ramona's past, but you don't get more detail. Whereas in the comic, it gets filled out more. And the reveal is that Ramona's kind of a piece of shit too. She cheats on a lot of her exes, she, and she very frequently runs from her problems instead of confronting them head on. Knives' story is also expanded upon. Um, you go from seeing her as she starts to be a lot more of a stalker in the comic than in the in the film, dating more than just young Neil, but also going after uh, uh, Stephen Stills and uh, having a, a more complete arc by the end. You you see just more flashbacks in general and see how Scott remembers things in uh, that we take for at face value in the film and in the early parts of the comic and how he misremembers them or recreates history. Um, you also get the experience uh, of the band growing over time because it's not about a battle of the bands in the comic. Uh, it's more about the band growing and getting better and starting an album and breaking up. And you also see more of Scott and Kim's dynamic that also has an arc through flashback and through present day situations. life in the comic. This is going to be the most important part of the video because there's a lot to write about and I'm also trying to sum it up. So in high school, Scott and Kim dated. They were introduced to each other when Scott and a different girl, Lisa, uh, started a band together called Sonic and Knuckles. Uh, when they were scouting for a drummer, Scott met Kim and they started dating. How they started dating was uh, Kim got kidnapped by a rival high school, Scott burst in, beat up a huge number of guys, and fought a boss and kicked his ass. At the end of that, he asked Kim out, and she said yes, they started dating. This is when they were kids in Peterborough, not in Toronto. When Scott's parents moved him away to Toronto, Scott broke up with Kim. At least, that's how Scott remembers it. Conveniently. In reality, that kid was Scott. Uh, in reality, that kid was Kim's boyfriend, and he beat him up for doing pretty much nothing wrong. And while he remembers breaking up with Kim and telling her that he was moving away, in reality, he never told her. He told Lisa, and Lisa told Kim, and Kim's heart got broken 
through a third party in a really gross way. Later in the story, when Ramona leaves Scott for several months, uh, he goes to visit Kim, who had moved back to Peterborough, and he's sort of in this weird phase where he's just trying to make out with or hook up with anybody who he dated before at that point. He's really vulnerable, but also acting like kind of a piece of shit. Uh, and during that time, him and Kim kiss, but then her and him both decide that he should go after Ramona. In the comic, Scott and Envy's relationship also gets fleshed out a bit more. It's revealed that they broke up at a New Year's party after Scott got drunk, had found out about the cheating, and made a massive scene. Envy even tells Scott that he broke her heart too, which Scott just can't comprehend because of, again, the way he remembers it in, in his sort of emotional state. After Ramona breaks up with him, he also bumps into Envy again and uh, propositions her for casual sex, and she declines. I know I've already talked a lot about Knives, but here's Comic Knives' story slightly in a nutshell, but not really. Scott dates Knives. Scott cheats on Knives. Scott breaks up with Knives. Knives becomes a stalker. She attacks Ramona in the public library. Uh, as she gets more and more obsessed with him, she starts dating young Neil, and uh, during a meeting with Envy, Envy hits her in the movie, Todd hits her. After that confrontation, Scott comforts her outside Lee's palace um, and apologizes for the whole situation, but doesn't admit to cheating. When everyone goes on vacation at the top of book four, Knives comes with them, and they let her get underage drunk. While Knives is drunk, she winds up making out with Kim, and everyone decides to never talk about it again. During Scott's aforementioned depressed post-breakup period, where he starts offering casual sex to everybody, uh, he makes out with a now over-18 Knives Chow, but neither of them really enjoy it. So one criticism of the comics is they treat the knives being underage thing as being more okay. They know it's bad, and but the comic understands that it's wrong, but it's treated as less wrong than the movie treats it. Um, like I said, they let her come with them and get drunk, even though she's two years underage in Ontario, Canada. Um, the drinking age is 19. If you're from America, you probably expect it to be 21. It's 19 here. Canada's good. When he tells the other characters they're mostly okay, Stephen Stills makes a crack that he should maybe get a high school-aged girlfriend when she takes Wallace to the, the, all, the, to the Catholic school. She says, I could tell you which boys in my class are gay. In the movie, he makes a funny comment. Uh, in the book, he actually seemed interested in it more so than in the film. And, like, that's pretty not good. I don't like that. I don't like that they treat that as being more okay. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's a bad thing. I think the movie took the right stance here. And that's not for me. By the way, that's not me saying that Brian Lee O'Malley thinks it's okay. Obviously, this thing was written years ago. And on top of that, <laughs> it's still shown as bad. It's just portrayed as somewhat less bad in the comic, which doesn't imply that that's what... The, person who made the comic thinks. Ramona and Scott's relationship is the focus of the story, ultimately. And like I said, in the movie, it doesn't get a lot of attention, but in the comic, you just get more. You get more time with them together, more understanding them apart, um, and you get to see them sort of do the relationship thing that you expect. Um, you get to see that, like, how they commit to each other, but what they fight about. Um, and you get to, again, it's more explained that Ramona is a serial cheater and a runner and how she's trying to run from her past. In the comic, to her, Gideon is like, he's a he's an abuser. He is really, really gross in the comic compared to the movie. 
Um, in the comic, uh, Gideon keeps five women in refrigerators on ice um, so that he can unthaw them and date them at different times of his life, pretty much uh, kidnapping them and raping them, which is really, really gross, really gross. But I get, I get they want to show him as an abuser, but still have like a sci-fi twist to it by having cryogenic freezing involved. It's a really gross thing. I don't think it, and I think it's on purpose. I think it's on purpose supposed to be gross. This sort of thing, while effective, sort of is emblematic of a, another issue I have with the writing, is that they bend over backwards, making every evil ex worse than Scott in a somewhat transparent way. Uh, Gideon, like I said, is just like a horrible piece of shit, um, while Todd cheats on Envy and hits girls, and uh, the Karinagis kidnap uh, Kim. Now... Even though in the movie, Lucas Lee is somewhat of a prick, in the book, he's less so, and he's willing to sit down with Scott and explain what's going on, which I think is kind of funny that he's a good guy, but I think also Chris Evans being the big, huge asshole in the movie is also great, but that's a side tangent. So yeah, as a whole, what do I think of Scott Pilgrim and women? Well, I don't get to be the guy who says this is the be-all, end-all reason. I think on purpose, it's trying to depict a person who's bad in relationships, who's a shittier person than he wants to be because he has low self-esteem, because he's this sort of toxic person. But the story, at least in the comic, is about him becoming a better person, finding that out about himself, and ultimately righting the wrongs he's done, and most people forgiving him, but he still gets to leave his past behind him, uh, in a sense. And I think that's cathartic for a lot of people who have done bad things and become good people or want to become better people, is that Scott Pilgrim says, if you're a piece of shit, you can get better. And whether or not you agree with that may affect how you see the series. Do you see the movie as a story meant to show somebody who's pretty much abusive? He's a user and a cheater, and, and it tries to redeem him. If you're the kind of person who says that's disgusting and I don't like that about the movie and that takes me out of it, especially if you're someone who's been cheated on or somebody who's had people do that to you, I understand if you want to say Scott Pilgrim is a sexist work because it tries to make an abuser um, relatable and tries to redeem them. And that's fair. That's a fair assessment. We all, like, we all look at art from a subjective lens. For me personally... I like that it's a story about a person who's pretty shitty, but becomes better. I think that's life affirming. I think that's optimistic. I want to believe people can get better. I'm not a huge piece of shit, I think, uh, but I've done bad things in the past or I've thought bad things and I have gotten better and I'd like to get better. And so to, to me, Scott Pilgrim is a worse, worse version of myself. Um, but it is somewhat affirming to, to see somebody get better. But again, that aspect of the story is handled poorly in the film and better in the comic. So ultimately, I can still look at both things and say, I think they're great. But again, art subjective. You're allowed to make your own decisions. Do these uh, aspects of it that may be harmful harm you or, or just harm your enjoyment? That's, again, totally fair. But to me, I would still heartily recommend both. But with the caveat of this video that there are issues with it or there are things that are in inherently disagreeable about it. But that's the, that's the nature of art. Thank you so much for making it through the whole video. I know it's long and it's not as good as I wanted it to be. But that's kind of how it is for a first time back after a long hiatus. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Um, please, you know, got to do the YouTube shit. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell. You know how it is. But please, in the comments, leave me some hopefully constructive criticism. I'd love to hear your feedback. Maybe have a discussion about it. Um, uh, my next video should be coming out next month. In the meantime, if you want to hear more of my stupid fucking voice, uh, please go ahead and uh, subscribe to the Media Hole podcast. It's on this YouTube channel already. Uh, it goes up weekly on Mondays. Otherwise, you can get it on Spotify, iTunes, 
uh, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, uh, or most other places you can get a podcast. Um, and thank you very much once again. I hope you have a great evening. By the way, quick tease, next month's video, Perfect Blue and Why We Tell Stories.